Um, stripe rust. We've kind of had some fun playing with stripe rust. This one was uh, this was a really hot infection when we went down. This was this was just one pint of O2YS. I don't know that we had anything else even in this one. And he's, you have something in with it. Oh yeah, because it's an adjuvant. It's an adjuvant. It's an adjuvant. So we yeah we mixed it with something. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see the the effect here. There was still. I would say on this field with one application with just this product, we had, I would say, a, a 90, at least 90% cure rate on this. There was still some pustule pockets you could find out there. I tried to take some pictures of the live pustules, but my photography skills that day in the middle of the day, I couldn't get the rust pustules to show up to show you the difference between that. Well, we didn't get all of it, but we did as well as any commercial product I've ever seen go out on a stripe rust infection that advanced. This is the loopers in the peas. I took a picture of one of these little buggers because like I say it just it blew me away. I couldn't figure out why there's this many little green worms on the ground. Why aren't they in the foliage and why if it kill why aren't, they weren't all dead. Some of them were definitely dead. Some of them were having a really bad day. So like I say, I made a phone call to Robin and he explained to me what was probably going on here, that it had taken this time within 24 hours, the plant had ramped up the chitinase levels within it. These guys were either being repelled by it or they had taken a bite and they're now on the ground dying of oral cancer, basically. Easy on the beneficials. So this picture is a little bit later in the season. This is actually on a field we rented out here to Burton this summer. And I don't know why in this pocket of the field, the ladybugs kept coming in. I did um, sweep nets, everything. I couldn't, I don't know what they were living on, but I had a pocket in this field where they just kept coming in again and again and again. Well, this was, so this field, we got the SBBC treatment. We put a pint per hundred weight on the seed of the O2YS. I think that was in the, anyway, Ken's from the bio release there. We planted this field 125 pounds to the acre, so we got just a hair over probably of the O2IS. We did this because out here to Burton, is uh, this was the second known place in North America for cereal cyst nematode. First place is in Corvallis, Oregon. This was right out here, was the second place ever discovered in 1976. And it's really surprising to me how many guys that farm out here don't know about this. Nobody talks about it, they're just grain production, so nobody ever pulls nematode tests. So we knew going into this deal it was probably hot. We got offered this deal the last minute, so we just cranked up the kitazan and rolled in there. Then we got nervous because uh, we, we got told that this isn't um, hard red spring country. We'll never get protein out here. That's why everything out here is either barley or soft white wheat. And then we got told that this is deoxynabalanol downtown, that everything out here, by the time you put enough water on a wheat crop, you're going to be hit and miss whether your dawn levels you're going to be able to sell the crop or not so we were a little bit panicked over this as we learned this through the summer from some of the neighbors we'd never farmed out here before so with what it got the first time we put another pint of o2 in at herbicide timing and then this was oh july -ish, end of july this was actually when market called me told me the success they're having with agri-grow we found ross talked to ross we decided yeah let's go try it so we took some foliar blend mixed in and we actually did a foliar application on this just prior to head emergence for the fusarium stuff all through the season though this pocket in the field had ladybugs and they would just be like born here and then move i never really saw many adults but the larval stage hung out here all summer and i just took a picture of this to show that it it didn't seem to have any effect on them. Walking the pea fields this summer, loaded with bees. It didn't seem to have any effect on the honeybee population at all. The honeybees don't feed on the plant. Right. And come to find out when I was researching honeybee stuff, because this kind of blew me away, any of the bees that they throw away from a hive, bees are a fantastic source of kitazan. Like they are just clear full of it. If somebody had some hive death stuff, whatever, scoop up the bees, go home, put them on your garden because bees actually are themselves a fantastic source of kitazan. But as you can see, oh, there's a couple of leaves here. You can actually, we had a little bit of rust show up in this field, but nothing. This was Westbred 9668, which is semi stuff into it, but yeah, you know, actually, there, there was, a, I mean, a little titch of rust here and there, but it got absolutely no commercial fungicide. We didn't put anything on. 
I'm not going to tell you this part, I'm not bragging anything, just to give you the data. We took across the scales off this field 102 bushel to the acre. It did 14.2% protein and the test levels for Dawn came back at 0.02%. So the infection was present but we apparently kept it in check. So does wonders on trees. This is uh, so the same guys that Mark works with on the uh, other picture there. This is one of Davey's pictures. They were soaking the seeds in a 2% solution here for these pine. This was a big nursery in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So soak the seeds. Anyway, got this on a... It's what? International paper. Oh, those little guys? Yeah. Oh, all right. So anyway, Davey talked him into doing a test on this. And um, one of the last time I talked to Davey a couple weeks ago, he's pretty popular in the nursery industry right now. They're seeing some pretty, yeah, pretty remarkable stuff here on their pine trees and seedlings. I guess this is my last one. I, anyway, I'm standing on, so in 2016, so we get a pallet of this stuff. We're not quite sure what to do with it. So this is, well, that was perfect timing. So this was where I went out and I said, I told you we broke this out into four test plots. When all summer long, like I couldn't, I'll go out once in a while and throw a foot square out and go count tillers, count kernels per head, do some average just for, I don't know, it's the way my stupid brain works, trying to guess what yield is and whatnot. I didn't see any difference all summer. Like we had kind of written this stuff off as another snake oil. We until the combine rolled in. And thank goodness for yield monitors or we would have missed this because we started cutting oh, over here, right next to Matt's airstrip. That field was a train wreck. It only did like 72 bushel to the acre that year. We started there and moved our way north, finished over here on this field. This one right here, like I had kind of forgotten about our test strips. Nothing really had showed up. We hadn't seen anything. So the 10 wheeler was parked right here at the end of the field. My dad is running the combine because that's his second favorite thing in the world to do behind drill grain and drink coffee. But the 10 wheeler's parked here. And I told him, when you get over here about where the duels are on the truck, see if you can see any difference in one side of the field to the other. All right. So he starts here on the south side, cuts the field to the north, calls me on the phone. He says, you know that spot you told me to test for, look for? I'm like, yeah. He says, yeah, he says, too bad your whole crop didn't go like that. He says, there was about 20 bushel to the acre difference between where we had put one pint on versus where we had put nothing on over here. Funny part of the story is I met Mark Nichols for the first time while I'm on the phone with my dad telling me, no, nah, I think your stuff actually worked as Mark pulls in the driveway to find us because we had given up on it. That was a special day too. We won't go there right now. <laughs> <laughs> he can be a little bit of an asshole when he wants to be, for lack of a better term. <laughs> Uh, but you can kind of see here, I'm standing on the line. So this right here strip is actually the last pass of the center of the combine. The test strip ends right here to the side. This one blew us away as much or more than the results we'd seen. Anyways, anyway, so the results we saw, we went back through to clock through the yield monitor to see what the rest of the fields had looked like. The field way over here by the airstrip was a seven bushel increase where we had put one pint of O2YS down that spring. This is the north side of this pivot. There was a test here and one over in the middle of it. Um, the one over here did a 19 bushel to the acre increase. This one right here did an 18 bushel to the acre increase. This right here was 21 bushel to the acre increase over the checks next to them on everything. Probably all just pints? Yeah, one pint. One pint of O2 was all, all we did that year. So we come in and did the fall work. We had a little rain and we were a little flabbergasted to realize that our test strip showed up in the regrowth. I don't really know why. I can't tell you what the difference was there, but as the fall progressed there, it just proceeded to get more and more pronounced. Like it just filled in. You could literally see, see right to the line. I don't know if it's a nematode issue. I'm gonna pull some tests off our place. We've never had Columbia stubby anything. We just never looked, never had a reason to. I'm gonna do some nematode stuff this summer and see if I can Maybe try to figure out clock exactly where the response is coming from. Might just be one of those things where you write it off as a gift that it just works. So this last growing season, we just decided this was the fastest we'd ever adopted anything because my farming partner is Mr. Skeptical and his dad is Mr. Nothing's ever gonna work. So after the results of this though, we, the whole farm, we just blanketed everything. Everything got a pint this year. 
We didn't even leave a test strip out anywhere, which again, the farmer in me and the scientist in me, we get in fights in the springtime with my dad and my brother because they allowed me two test strips a year now because I can get kind of carried away and this gets ridiculous, but we didn't even leave anything out. Our yield last year though, and again, just to relay the data, don't take this as I'm bragging because I'm an average farmer at best, but we usually make our yield estimates for 100 bushel wheat barley in our country up here. That's what we shoot for is 100. Fertilizer wrecks are all shooting for 100. We usually wind up in the 90 range somewhere. That's just kind of where we, we make um, barley contracts based on about 95. Last year was the best we'd ever done. Our barley, our barley did 111 bushel average across the farm. The wheat did 110 bushel average across the farm. We still just shot for the same 100 bushel that we usually usually get. So anyway, that is uh, that's the end of mine. So.